host can we start the session Hi to you ladies and gentlemen it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to second edition of Morning City Literature Festival organized by SGR Knowledge Group I am Muskan Bhate anchor for this session and topic for this session is my experience about writing in different genres the speaker for the same is Kiran Manwal Kiran Manwal ma'am lives in Mumbai she is an award winning and best selling indian author edx speaker columnist mentor and feminist She has written books across genres in both fiction and non-fiction. We welcome you, ma'am. Samantha Bhadra is the moderator for this session. Samantha Bhadra's poems and reviews have been published in magazines and anthologies like Rain Taxi, The Missing Slate, Vika O Poem, and Taj Mahal Review, among others. He has been conducting poetry reading and workshops in Bangalore, Pune, and Mumbai since 2014. He is a TEDx speaker and Millennium Fellow, and has worked in sales, marketing, and PSR roles with Titan Company before joining Manjin Publication Publishing House as the head of marketing and promotions. Currently, he runs his own branding, marketing, and art consulting company called The Sound, through which he helps authors and publishers to market their books better. Thank you for this session, sir. You, Samantha, sir. Thank you so much, Muskan. Thank you so much. Uh, uh. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a wonderful Saturday today, and I'm absolutely honored and delighted to in con Kiran today. And uh, yeah, many of you may have already read at least one, or even more than one, or even probably all of the books that Kiran has written over the years. And you know, uh, I'm extremely honored to know. You know uh, You know why I say honor? There is that there is a particular uh, reason behind it. You know, uh, you know, being prolific and being versatile at the same time takes a certain kind of takes a possibly a certain kind of determination. You know, more than talent. And for me, that's that's something that's something I absolutely admire about Kiran today. And Kiran, thank you for you know being in conversation with me. Yeah, uh, you know, and uh, uh. It's actually, uh, you know, if I if I if I if I, if I particularly remember at the Times Lit Fest uh, in February this year, uh, this versatility that I speak of was particularly, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was it was something that was like you know physically visible to me, you know, uh, when I actually saw you in conversation with Ashwin Sanghvi, and then quickly get over, run off to a session to do, you know, a session on parenting, you know, that close knit group, with, you know, like you know. That complete, it was essentially. I I probably use the phrase toxic to be, you know, that I felt in one frame of mind in one atmosphere altogether, and then I see you moving into that kind of an atmosphere, which is, you know, another space altogether. Not only fiction to non-fiction, but think about it. Like you know, you're talking to Ashwin Sanghvi, and the next moment you're talking to parents, you know. And uh, for me, that was really the physical interpretation of how I'm known you as a writer, you know. Uh, and you know, of course, through Marilis, through Manjul. All the previous conversations we've had. Um, without further ado, I'd love to, you know, uh, probably then ask you. You know, that's this is one question that's always been on my mind. But of course, I've never really had the, I'd say, opportunity to ask you this question. What does, you know, uh, a day in the life of Kiran Mandra, the writer, look like? You know, what's your what's your what's your writing discipline like? You know, what's your routine like? You know, how do you do what do you do essentially? um thank you so much for the kind words amanta it's been a pleasure knowing you and you've worked on uh, with me to promote my books at manjul and i'm always very grateful for the efforts you put in because those were difficult books to push and uh, i don't know about the prolific and i don't know about the versatile i don't know about all that all i know is that i write the books that i want to write and i write uh, the books that are the me at that space and time and that frame of mind so you know sometimes i may be in a very noir frame of mind sometimes i may be in a very funny light hearted way of mind frame of mind so i think that's what happens i think with all of us we are multiple people within one so the books come out that way what's a day in the life of kiran manral like it's very boring to be honest it's terribly boring i wouldn't wish it on anybody it's just but to sit and uh, 
from the morning it is being at my desk it's doing my bread and butter work because as we all know being writers your bread and butter does not come from writing books your bread and butter comes from other stuff writing is like something you do on the side it's a side hustle so there's bread and butter work there is uh, the writing that i do so at any given point of time i may have some 10 15 tabs open on my desktop because i'll be putting in stuff for a project report somewhere. I'll be sort of surfing the net on the other. I will be going on social media. I will be looking at doing the research for one manuscript, doing the edits on one manuscript. So it's just uh, that, uh, Samantha, it's nothing but uh, but to see it and the discipline to stay at your desk to it all because it's easy not to work. It's easy to say that I'll do it tomorrow. It's easy to say I don't feel inspired right now, but just very hard work is what I would say constitutes a writer's life and being terribly boring in your personal life. I think, uh, I forget who said that, but I think it was, uh, I forget who said it, but it was be orderly and disciplined in your life so you can be flamboyant and imaginative in your work. Some words to that effect. I think that's what defines writing primarily. In fact, uh, you know, when I think about it, uh, um, frankly, uh, I, 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 I do remember last year military festival. Uh, there was a particular, thing, I think, in Bangalore literature, literature festival. We did talk about this fact that you know, we writers we surface from literature festival to festival, Absolutely. and then we went to hiding. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Know? We live in caves throughout the time. So this entire notion of us having very glamorous lives and, you know, living it up to the hilt is quite misplaced. I think I, now everyone has stopped, but I think I've rejected, uh, gently turned down, made excuses for the pan. I love the pandemic because I don't need to make excuses anymore. I turn down everything that comes my way, dinner, invitations, lunch meets, social engagements, except if it's connected for work and I know that I would have uh, some I read publicist or uh, publisher yell at me if I don't show my face at those things. But uh, for the most part of it, I'm just in my work cave. And I think that's what makes us writers. We are inside ourselves rather than outside most of times. I mean, uh, this actually takes me to a very impromptu sort of a question. You know, this, 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 this very uh, much of often debated, much often maligned, much often glorified phrase called writer's block. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about it? I would love to know your views on that. In fact, just uh, before this live, there, I was having a quite an animated discussion with Nimish Dubey. If you know him, he's a tech writer and a, a writer of fiction, non-fiction too, on Twitter about writer's block. And I said that, it's an indulgence for writers to say that you have a writer's block. If you're a professional writer and you consider yourself one, you just sit and write because at the end of the day, you can always edit a bad page. Someone else has already said, <laughs> but you can do nothing with a blank page. So you write what you write and you write through the so-called writer's block. Yeah, there are times when you feel that the words are not coming. There are times when you feel you have nothing to say. And that's normal because you know, you keep feeding your mind with stuff and there will come a point when you feel there's nothing in the mind to put out. So at those points, I think you need to keep restocking yourself, whether it be by more reading, whether it be by more watching, life experiences, whatever it is. But to say that you have a writer's block and to, to take time out from your work in progress, that's lethal because uh, that will stop your flow completely. Don't... Uh, don't indulge in it. If you find yourself blocked and find yourself in a space where you can't write anymore, take a little while off, I would say maybe a day at the max. But just stay with your manuscript, tinker with it, even if it's just to change a full stop or a comma or read over certain portions. But don't uh, completely stop and say, I have a writer's block, I can't write. That's like the death knell for whatever work in progress. <laughs> no, but but this is also frankly speaking, it's it's been a question that's plagued me all too quite a few times. I've been, you know, those those, you know, you are your own worst enemy, right? You know, so therefore, I the writer's block as a as a phenomenon, you know, is always there. It's the elephant in the room, right? So I, I 
it was it was therefore a question that just automatically came up in my mind when you're talking about you know um, so i'm so sorry uh, we started writing you know uh, right passion to believe when we started writing essentially we started writing about humor and romance you know what you know i i'm i'm curious so, but but essentially what got you what what, what essentially got you into that genre what made you think that this is the genre that i want to start off my writing journey with you know um i didn't plan it at all samantha to be honest i had been writing a blog for the longest time the blog was called karmic kids it was a very fun voice it was the voice of a 30 something mom which i was at that point when i was writing it with a small 5 year old 4 uh, year old kid and that voice sort of transposed itself into my first book which was the reluctant detective and it came very easily to me and it's a similar space and mind space that my latest book the pity party murder is in with the same bunch of characters but uh, the thing is that that was something i've been writing for 10 years so it just came very naturally when i first started deciding to you know go into fiction so i just change a little things here and there and put it all into fiction romance came about no i re- no air chocolate came after that i think uh, after people kept saying that uh, the reluctant detective was chocolate and i said no it's not chocolate it's momlet it's henlet it's a very different uh, space to have it because like the mind space is completely different the thought process of a mom in the mid 30s is completely different from chocolate uh, novel So that's when I decided to write Once Upon a Crush, which was secret. Romance All Aboard uh, was commissioned to me by Penguin. So uh, my lovely editor, Penguin Vaishali Mathur, uh, was follow- uh, we were following each other on Twitter. And I think she liked what uh, I was tweeting. So she asked me if I'd be interested in doing a romance. And that's how the romance came about. Saving Maya was also a commissioned romance. Uh, so that's how the two romances came about. there was no thought process to be honest it was just writing what came to me and uh, that's what i've been doing whether it came to me internally for myself or externally from somebody commissioning a book it's just what i kept doing i would like to say there was a very deep thought process and i planned it out but nothing like that i mean i mean when you think about i mean the fact that when when you look back right i mean it's been nearly a decade i would say right <laughs> essentially for you know uh, so when we as readers when we in the external world look back on your journey sometimes that question is wont to come was there you know was there a you know uh, you know was there a particular reason why you started off with this genre so in my mind i i just wanted to kind of you know come back and ask you and just check by chance if there was some story you know behind the curtains something that might have you know inspired you or like you know uh you know and you know being the stimulus to the way your writing has progressed over the years you know for example like you know you went from fiction to writing you know you had the you had the blog on parenting right but then your first book was fiction and then you moved on to writing uh you know publishing non fiction too so from that perspective i mean like you know how do you think fiction and non fiction is different as far as you as a writer is concerned you know because it's the same person but you're writing fiction at one point in time writing non fiction again and then you again swiveling back to fiction and back again so you know is writing non fiction and fiction different or or is it really the same it's it's or will you just say that these are just labels at the end of the day they are very different processes it's a very different uh, mind space you inhabit when you're writing both because with the fiction uh, you are delving into your imagination you're delving into something that's not real you're creating characters places people situations ca- uh, story lines arc uh, story plots uh, points of conflict you're doing all that with non fiction you delve into what is already there what is existing in the real world you have to take from that you have to have your facts in place you have to have your research in place and for that i think that's where my years of journalistic experience come in handy because that's my training ground i was a journalist with uh, the asian age of times of india with the uh, the india today group at cosmopolitan um i forget where it's lots of places but uh, these were the places i cut my teeth in journalism and uh, it's pretty hard training ground so i know 
to get my non-fiction in place. But I also like to tell stories. I've always been a big storyteller. I was always the one in the playground, to, you know, catching the rest of them and telling me, Acha, I will tell you a bhuti kahani now. So, <laughs> or a whatever, you know, what happened to me and embellishing it up to like, something really really funny or really whatever even if it was something completely ordinary so i have always been a storyteller and somehow i think i arrived at a happy mix of being able to use both skills the non-fiction as well as the fiction so i'm in a happy place right now i can use both of them <laughs> but I the mean, skill sorry the skill sets are very different for both i mean this actually prompts another question in my mind right now i mean even in non-fiction do you employ the art of storytelling in a sense? I mean, of course you do in many ways to, to engage the reader. But, uh, you know, I'm just talking generically. I mean, considering the nonfiction you've written and the nonfiction you would write in the future, you know, uh, is storytelling a really big aspect? Is it really important to really catch the imagination it is. of the target audience there? It is. Uh, for nonfiction like A Boy's Bride to Growing Up, or cutting steps to bloody good parenting or raising kids with hope and joy in times of climate change and pandemic maybe it's not storytelling maybe it's just presenting an argument or, or, or presenting a point of view and trying to convince people that this is how things should be but for non-fiction like uh, true love stories storytelling becomes very important in those in that kind of non-fiction because unless you're able to narrate the love story very accurately how are you going to read, uh, read it in or the forthcoming non-fiction that I'm working on, which is a commission book by Rupa Publishing, which is on iconic women of India. Uh, so that is also primarily research-based. And But it is storytelling. It's telling the story of their lives. And it's telling it, I mean, I have to have my facts in place. I can't take the liberty of telling it in first person because it's not my personal story to tell. Or it's not an autobiography or a memoir. So I can't take that liberty. So I have to tell it with a third person gaze, but I have to also tell the story in a way that makes it interesting for the reader. So in that sense, yes, nonfiction does have storytelling. It depends on the kind of nonfiction. If you're writing a self-help book, there will be some amount of storytelling because you'll be giving anecdotes and instances from people's lives and you'll be sort of putting them all together to get the message through. Completely depends. If you're doing a non-fiction, which is uh, on the financial markets, uh, there could still be storytelling because you might be telling the story of somebody who, who took some very risky trades and how they hedged their food, bets or whatever. So there is some amount of storytelling in everything, but uh, the degree is very. I mean, now that we're talking of stories, and you know, of course, like it, you know, essentially jump into, you know, literary noir, right? We talked about, and and you know, uh, you know, and uh, having had the privilege of, kind of, I would say, I mean, I mean, I, you know, uh, getting to know you as a thriller writer through Amaryllis, first, <laughs> and then the other, and then the other, other versions. Also, thanks to Thanks is best, you know. Um, at the time, I mean, this is just, uh, you know. In a sense, but 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 uh, the thing is, I mean, uh, you know, uh, um, similar to the similar to the initial question I asked, you know, what what you know, what got you into literary noir? What got you into writing into you know thriller horror as a space is is of course you know it's a crowded space, but also at the same time it's a it's a specialized space. It's a it has it has very particular challenges of its own, right? It's just not, you know, there's there's so much background work, work I'm sure you have to do for, for writing each of these books and for the forthcoming title, you know? Uh, one is what got you into literary noir, thriller writing as a space, and secondly, you know, which, are, if at all, are there any writers or any, you know, uh, you know, writer books that might have also inspired you in a sense? So, I always keep saying this, Samantha, my two favorite writers, or three favorite writers, I would say, are P.G. Uh, Woodhouse, Stephen King, and Murakami. And I keep going back to these influences over and over again. So, with P.G. Woodhouse, you see it coming out in books like The Reluctant Detective, Once Upon a Crush, The Kitty Party Murder. Uh, even karmic kids, which is non-fiction, it's fun, light-hearted, a quick read, and it's also very layered, a social commentary, a bit of a satire, a situational comedy. So that comes out in those books. 
when you go to my Stephen King and my Murakami obsessions, then that's what comes out in books like The Face of the Window or uh, Missing Presumed Dead or even the forthcoming More Things in Heaven and Earth, which is going to come out from Mamrilist uh, hopefully early next year. These are all very dark books. I, uh, they've been called literary noir, literary crime noir, literary thriller noir. I, I, I don't know all the kinds of titles that uh, the genres get, but uh, they come from a very dark space in me. And the characters, the situations, the, uh, the parts they go through, they're dark, they're twisted, they're tangled. And I think I'd like to think that the dark balances out the light in a way. So if, you know, anything tips over, so if there's a dark book, there's a light book to balance it out. Why did I choose it? I don't think I chose it. And I don't think the space is overcrowded in India. I think the space for literary noir, the space for horror writing, the space for literary thriller is very limited. We have a lot of popular fiction in this space. We have a lot of uh, romance writing. We have a lot of YA writing. We have quite a fair deal of chiclet writing. But uh, who are the horror writers in India? The thriller writers are very, uh, we have some best-selling thriller writers, but even the thriller writers are limited. So this space is something that is emerging. It's a buoyant space right now. And I'd like to think that I'm, the books I write aren't uh, books that can be put into a particular slot or a genre. They're just very amorphous at the moment. <laughs> they could be horror, they could be thriller, they could be psychological drama, they could be anything. I've lost your audio. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, from, you know, uh, there's even a question from the audience right now. You know, which I'd like to tie in right away because you know it's it's probably also uh, you know um, if I have to kind of uh, rephrase the question, the audience member is asking that you know one what impact of a story is experienced by its readers, you know uh, you know uh, uh, is there a difference in, in in the way a story is experienced if the protagonist is a female? I should hope not. I should hope that the human experience cuts across genders. I mean, if something uh, is, a, a, if there's a story that is uh, relevant to a woman, it should also be relevant to a man. But we all know that that is not true. We all know that uh, stories that are written by women are primarily uh, very internal. They're very, uh, they're called domestic, personal. The themes are smaller, more intimate, more, uh, perhaps psychological. So the audience might respond to it in a different way. It, it completely depends upon the kind of story and the kind of storytelling within it. So there are stories with a female protagonist that definitely do affect men very strongly. For instance, uh, if I can think, uh, I can't think of anything right now, but uh, there are definitely stories which uh, have become classics and which, you know, appeal across genders. Having said that, we do know that there is a reluctance, a hesitation for men to pick up books that center around female protagonists. I don't know why that is so. Uh, yeah, we have the girl with the dragon tattoo, which I think had a female protagonist, and I think was read equally well but by men and by women. There are uh, books like that, but... Uh, if it is more uh, an uh, emotional drama or a romance or uh, something that is uh, more personal, more domestic, I think men would respond to it differently than the women readers would respond to it. And that's natural. That's a given. As writers, I don't think we need to be thinking about which gender will respond in what way to our books. We just need to write our stories as truly and honestly as you can tell them. Because once you decide that this is my target audience and this is my market uh, you already sold out on half your soul while writing <laughs> so, so uh, no it makes sense because it, it is a commercial proposition at the end of the day but uh, in, but having said that i think we just stay true to the storytelling if it's a good story and it's told with honesty and truth men and women alike will read it and identify with it to some extent in a sense, I mean, I mean, I guess there's a little bit of a systemic uh, 
element in this because you know as you said that i i i had a flashback you know back in school days i don't know how much of this is relatable but uh, when i was in school hardy boys and nancy dues were all the rage, were all the rage right and uh, you know as in a guy school if you were seen picking up a nancy drew detective novel you'd be looked at by your friends you'd be judged like how can you read a nancy drew novel of all things you know yeah. and vice versa i'm pretty sure about that right you know so i guess i guess in a sense it is of course that systemic element of the idea or the or this whole proposition of the kind of literature that men should read you know as opposed to the kind of literature that women should read you know in a sense i'm guessing i'm guessing as you grow up uh, you know you're of course able to rec- reckon with the of the person but to a certain extent also it subconsciously subliminally kind of stays with you you know if there is a detective novel with a woman as the lead character protagonist as opposed to a set of other books in the same bookshelf and the same book rack uh that has multiple other male characters chances are you might feel that those books would be far more pc you know might uh, you know might have a lot more you know uh, masala in it to really you know capture your attention it might be like oh, i'm just i'm just i'm just i'm just wondering out loud essentially you know as you see that you know uh, while this may be true and it is true to a certain extent i also do put this example out there whenever this discussion comes up that we have agatha christie writing for her who's a male detective that's a woman writing a male detective and it's popular across genders so uh, it can happen men and women can love a character and we have uh, we have so many uh, female writers writing female detectives and they are also very popular but patricia high smith and uh, so many of them so i don't know i'm very conflicted on this on one hand as you say there is a systemic divide which prevents you from picking up a certain book because you expect it to be female in its uh, entire premise but on the other hand we have had very good examples of people who have been both genders and i think it's just a matter of picking the book up and reading it and once you've crossed that initial first hurdle i think it's then you go further with the other books from the same author uh you know with on that note i'll probably also like to ask you like you know uh, this is uh, this is a question that uh that's that probably came up in my mind a while ago it's not a new question is you know when i looked at the face of the window it's a true blue out and out filler right set in shimla set in woods you know like it has that atmosphere about it it has those kind of characters the whole mood and narrative style everything is a pure blue mood you know like a thriller right uh if i move forward if if i if i look at you know the next book in the same genre so to say which is which is missing presumed dead you know uh we see that it's of course a thriller in a sense but <laughs> but um there is this larger facet around mental illness and about the need for you know uh coming to terms with mental illness you know uh many writers have you know tackled this issue in many various ways even even indian writers but but i am particularly intrigued by the evolution in which your writing has taken i mean you you chosen filler you know like as a genre to rather portray this idea to talk about mental illness i'd love to know a little bit about this journey of yours So uh, the story didn't come about uh, the face of the window is horror actually it's thriller horror or whatever but it's more horror than anything else uh, this is psychological thriller as it was you say and uh, the story didn't the genre didn't come to me the main protagonist came to me the main protagonist who is this lady a middle aged lady with uh, all kinds of issues and the kind of space she is in and the kind of dissonance she is having so that's how the entire narrative progresses it starts with the protagonist it starts with the space and the life stage of the protagonist is and it became a thriller it became a thriller because she went away and she never came back and what happened to her so that the type of mice made it a thriller but it's also a very emotional journey it's also a very explorative journey of her and uh, the kind of struggle she goes through to come to terms with what she's experiencing so in that sense it crosses uh, it does become a psychological uh, 
thriller, so to speak. But uh, no, Samantha, I didn't really plan on making it a particular genre. I, as I said, I just wrote the story and then the slots and the boxes came after the story was done. I've also read this about, uh, you know, I've also read about, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, uh, junk that. I mean, I mean, if I just have to ask you act about activism in writing, how do you feel about that? Because of course, you know, uh, you know, there are there are there are there are prominent reasons of that in 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 a lot of things you write. You know, how do you feel about that? You know, not only mental illness. You know, about 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 pushing the you know uh, pushing the right idea of feminism, and uh, so many other elements. I mean, how, how do you feel about activism in writing in that sense? All writing that comes from a place of empathy and understanding will have some elements of activism. If it doesn't, it is not genuine writing. It is writing uh, to pander to an audience. If you're writing as a writer, you have a social commentary to make. Even in a book like my most recent book, The Kitty Party Murder, it is a comment on women who have had to drop out of the workforce in order to raise their children. And it is a comment on the pressures on women to appear a certain way, to be a certain way, to dress a certain way. It is a comment on uh, women of a certain class who feel constrained by the kind of expectations society places on them. It's all done very lightheartedly. It's all very funny. You laugh and you laugh. Uh, the same with uh, Once Upon a Crush, for instance. It is a comment on pressures women face when they're turning 30 to get married, to settle down, to have kids. So there are comments everywhere. There is uh, a social comment everywhere. Beneath the layers, I would like to think all my writing has some layers of social commentary. And that's what it should be. It, you don't need to be putting your message out there in the face of the reader that this is what you have to do. You have to save the world. You have to save the climate. Yeah. Not really. Uh, but I, uh, but uh, the fact means that you have to Put in something for a reader to take away. Maybe not obviously, not in their face, not uh, as a, you know, a flag waving kind of a situation, but something more insidious perhaps. But if you, you are an aware writer and if you are socially aware, that will come through somewhere or the other, whether you plan to put it in or you don't. Regardless, it will be there. There will be comment. There will be activism. There, it might be subtle. It might be out there, but uh, I mean, we have writers like Mahashweta Devi who have been such brilliant activists all their lives and have written such strong stories. So there is a spectrum of being overtly an activist in your writing or subtly putting it in. And where you choose to fall in that spectrum as writers completely up to. In fact, it's very interesting because, you know, like, uh, you know, you were a journalist before and a writer now, you know, uh, and also, um, you know, I, I mean, Activism in both these spaces is so very different, right? You know, you uh, you know you know you know uh, activism and journalism. I'm, I'm guessing is a, is a more calling a speed a speed kind of writing. <laughs> while 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 activism, I mean, if you know, I, I, I that's a different debate altogether. I mean, you know, I can, but 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 I mean, I mean, activism and writing. I'm guessing you know needs a little bit of that subtlety, right? Uh, which is able to hook on the writer, the reader. Sorry. It does. You need to be uh, telling your story and you need to be telling it well enough for the reader to stay with you as you tell your story and you get their attention and you hold it until the very end. So that's a challenge in itself. Journalism, honestly, I don't recognize half of what passes as journalism these days. I'm so glad to be up to it, to be honest, because I look at the uh, television channels and I shudder. So <laughs> let me not even get into that. But uh, all I feel is that uh, if you aren't using your words to create awareness about certain things, when you have the attention of the people who are reading you, you're wasting your words. So it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It can just be somewhere in the story where you talk about agency or consent or, uh, you know, call out sexual violence in a marriage. Anything. I mean, even a little bit in a book is enough. It all adds up. In fact, I'll probably then, as, we, as we're kind of nearing the end of the talk, 
I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, the thing is, um, uh, as we are, as we are basically nearing the you know end of the entire conversation, I'd probably like to ask you a question or two about publishing as a space, right? You know, how do you think publishing as an industry has kind of evolved in Indian publishing essentially? You know, uh, because you, you've worked with multiple publishers over the course of your career. Uh, you know, uh, how do you think it's what what excites you the most about Indian publishing per se? I think. Uh... We've moved on from the time when um, most publishing was considered Indian. I'm, I'm speaking purely of Indian writing in English because that's the space I'm familiar with. Language publishing has been wonderful and fertile and we've had wonderful writing in that space, but I've not been part of that ecosystem. So I don't want to comment on that. But Indian writing in English has moved on for, from a space where it was very limited. There was a lot of gatekeeping. It was considered very elitist. To a time when, you know, I think we all owe Chetan Bhagat a big uh, thank you for opening it up to us. You know, um, uh, we are the Midlist writers. We are the writers who are neither literary nor popular. And uh, there seems to be space for everyone right now. And it's still in a state of flux. They're still searching as to what works and what doesn't work. Self-publishing has come in in a big way. So we have people who are choosing to get self-published. People who are already traditionally published are also exploring self-publishing. So it's a ni nice hybrid that's happening right now. And uh, I see it opening up a lot more. I I see, uh, sorry, we have all sorts of shouting going on at home. Uh, I see a lot more people looking at writing as uh, not something that uh, is very aspirational, but something they can do, which I think is, I mean, we may, that's hopeful. It's, we may laugh at it saying that a lot more people are writing books than people reading books. But the fact is there is an interest in the ecosystem and there's uh, accessibility. Thankfully in India, you don't necessarily need an agent to get your books published. You can still directly approach a publisher and send in your manuscript. And if you're lucky, you'll be taken You'll be picked up, which is what happened to me for my first book. Western picked it up. I just sent it in to Dipti Talwar. She very sweetly liked it and took it up. Having said that, there is a lot of very <laughs> books of very. I don't know, and then I might sound elitist when I say that too. But I, I think we are going to see a shakeout, and we will see popular and good writing come together. In fact, I'd probably ask you uh, to, to, to basically, uh, you know, end this conversation with probably one or two maximum questions. Uh, you know, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the next book that's coming up, you know, uh, you know uh, if you could just, you know, tell us a bit about, you know, the experience of publishing it, the experience of writing it, a little bit of a, you know, sneak peek into what is, you know, what our readers can expect. So I've just brought out The Kitty Party Murder that's come out from HarperCollins and that's a fun, laugh out loud read. And uh, it's, uh, as Women's Web just called it, you know, it's a thriller and it's a funny book. It's two books for the price of one. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a different kind of read. What's coming out early next year from Amaryllis is called More Things in Heaven and Earth. It's a very dark, grim story. It's a noir story about... Uh, a young woman who loses her husband and is trying to come to terms with it, with closure with it. Of course, uh, all my books, uh, all these books which I write, which come from the heart and are very emotionally wrenching for me to write. I gave Rashmi Menon at Avrilis. These are books that she understands and she is an editor I love working with because uh, she completely get, gets my books and my writing, especially this. And she is very nurturing as an editor. So, uh, Working with Amrilis has been a breeze. I mean, these books, they, not many people would dare bet on them, but they put everything behind these books. So I'm very grateful. And hopefully more things than Heaven and Earth should be out early next year. And let's see if, if anyone has enjoyed reading The Face at the Window and Missing Presumed Dead. It's in that same category, genre, bracketing, shelf, box, whatever you choose to call it. It's dark, it's grim, and it will wrench your heart out. <laughs> I have probably one final question uh, from the audience, okay. you know, and probably just to end off with that. Uh, uh, the audience member says stories are character builders. You know, how far is that true? We have always been told stories from the time we were children. 
you know, at our grandma's knees and uh, in school, we had moral science stories, we had stories uh, which sort of, we had parables in the Bible, Jesus told his, his, uh, his, uh, his followers parables to make them understand certain things. We have uh, Jataka tales, we have Krishna uh, sto childhood stories, we have Akbar and Birbal. We have so many stories which attempt to teach us a lesson. Because very often what uh, saying something very flatly, don't do this, this is not uh, good, this is bad, or this is not desirable behavior. It's easier to convey the message in a story. So stories, yes, they can be character builders. But I don't want stories to be written with the aim of being character builders. Stories, it, that should be incidental to the story. If you're writing a story for it primarily to be a character building story, then it's not a story somebody will enjoy. It's a moral science lesson. Then you might as well have it, call it a moral science lesson and be done with it. But if you're writing a story to amuse, to entertain, to give a person a certain amount of catharsis, a certain amount of release, then it has to be story first and the message comes, if it does. So that's a very fine balance to tread. Yes, thank you so very much, Kiran. Uh, as always, it's always a pleasure conversing with you. Today's been no different. It's, you know, uh, thank you so much. I actually learned a lot, you know, uh, especially, especially, you know, when it came to con those mini conversations around writing itself, you know, uh, you know, for me, that's been, that's been a bit of a revelation. That's been, thank you so much for, you know, you know, might I use the word, and I know it sounds a little dramatic, but I'm still going to use the word and trolling for our audiences, you know, and it's, 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 it's been, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. You know, thank you so much, Kiran. Thank you so much for taking the time out to do this, you know, and for you know, giving us a little bit of a sneak peek into what we can expect next year too from you. Thank you so much for the conversation, Samantha, and all the interesting questions. All the very best to you for your efforts and your writing also. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Muskan. On behalf of Maureen City Literature Festival, I would like to thank our speaker, Ms. Kiran Manral, and our moderator, Samantha Ghazza, for their session expectance and knowledge shared with us. I would also like to thank our publisher, Amralis, for their constant support. Thank you so much. Our next session is politics really about serving the nation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Bye. Thank See you, you all. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye. Please read my books, Muskan. Yes, surely. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye, sir. 20 years of existence. Two universities, 23 educational institutes, offering 137 courses. Thy Sony Group of Institutions, a vision beyond. Host, host, hello, hello.